I'm going to go over some of some of the, the kind of things I see as important in, in kind of modern neural data analysis. Um, a lot of these these topics um, were actually described in, in um, a, a review article that I wrote with, with my friend John Cunningham that came out a couple years ago. Um, everything we said in that article is still pretty current. Um, so, so take a look at that if, if you want to kind of look look a bit more in the in the literature and, and kind of get, get into these these details a little bit more. Um, all right, cool. I'll, I'll jump jump right in. All right, so yeah, I mean this is you know a, a really really exciting area to be working in right now. So so you know I think there's a, there's there's just an incredible an incredible amount of, of cool stuff to do in this in this area, right? So we have we've got fast big parallel computation, right? We've got you know obviously there's been an explosion of of great new machine learning tools over the past decade that's that's changed the world, not just neuroscience. Um, we have we have these these science fiction methods for recording from large scale populations of neurons, even even whole brains in some contexts. Um, and we can also kind of you know shoot laser beams into the brain and affect behavior, right? It's it's kind of a, a crazy science fiction world we live in. Um, and and kind of you know more importantly, I, I see a lot of the you know the critical open questions in neuroscience, the, the the you know the fundamental problems that that got a lot of us into neuroscience. A lot of these are actually kind of statistics problems if you if you look at them the right way, and and if you kind of translate these these neuroscience problems into statistics or machine learning problems, you can make some really really kind of nice progress. Um, one of the, the one of the big bottlenecks I see in the field is is that we just don't have enough. Um, people who can kind of speak both languages of, of statistics and machine learning and neuroscience and kind of translate back and forth and, and push push this field forward. Um, so I hope I hope that some of you kind of, you know, get into this area and, and, and help us kind of solve some of these really, really exciting problems. So, you know, what, what do I mean by, by neural data science or, or statistical neuroscience, right? I, I you know, maybe, maybe unsurprisingly, I, I try to take a, a pretty broad view um, a, a greedy view of, of what what statistics can kind of bring to, to neuroscience right so so some of some of these kind of statistical neuroscience questions are very classical right what's you know we think about encoding problems and decoding problems right what what information is encoded in large populations of, of neural activity um, how do we decode that information into things that that are useful um, obviously there's there's been some some pretty cool YouTube videos on the decoding problem recently um, that's that's driven a lot of interest in this field. Um, another big question, you know, what, you know, can we, can we take, can we take populations of activity, you know, the, you know, can we look at hundreds of, of, of neurons kind of firing away and, and figure out how, how things are connected to each other, right? That's, that's a topic that, that I know has been um, interesting to, to, to some of, some of the speakers in this, in this summer school. Or vice versa, can we, you know, if, if you hand me kind of an EM reconstruction of a brain or a small part of a brain, can you can you predict what the dynamics of, of that circuit are going to be, right? So we can go kind of back and forth here. Um, you know, now that we're now that we have the technology to record from from multiple regions of the brain simultaneously, one of the one of the really interesting questions these days is to figure out, you know, how do the dynamics of one brain area impact the dynamics of another brain area, and, and what kind of cool circuit models can we build that are constrained by data to to kind of, um, you know, make inferences about that. I already mentioned, you know, optogenetics, and then of course you can also perturb the the brain with with you know, magnetic or, or electrical kind of stimuli. So, so that's, that brings up a really interesting kind of real time optimal control problem, right? Can I, can I kind of record some activity, figure out what's going on in, the, in, that, in that circuit and then kind of optimally perturb that circuit to behave in, in a way that I, I want it to behave or to optimally figure out what's, what's connected to what, for example. Um, and then there are more basic questions, you know, what, what, what is a cell type, right? How do I how do I determine cell types from morphology and you know molecular information and functional information? Um, how do I figure out how many cell types there are? Right? These are these are just completely fundamental neuroscience problems, but 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 again, they're they're really kind of statistics problems in, in disguise. Um, you know, what is the best experiment I should run next? Again, just a completely fundamental problem that experimentalists have to answer every day. 
Um, and, and if you bring to bear the technology of, of optimal experimental design, you can kind of do, do interesting, cool things. I could go on, right? So, so there's, there's lots of really fundamental open neuroscience problems that are, are really statistical in, 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 in nature, right? So those are the kinds of problems we want to tackle. Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the big motivations for my group over the last few years has, has been this, this collaboration we're a part of, this, this International Brain Lab. Um, so if, if you haven't heard of this, um, you, can, you can check out this, this kind of position paper that, um, that we, we published a couple years ago. Um, and then more recently, we, we have kind of our first big kind of data release um, that, that happened, I guess, this, this year. Um, so, so the point of this lab is, is to try to record the electrical activity from, from the whole mouse brain as, as the mouse performs a, a kind of a well-defined um, simple behavior, right? So we wanna understand decision-related activity throughout the whole mouse brain. And the way we're, we're attacking this is we have about 10 or so experimental labs who have set up this, this behavior that's described in this paper. Um, kind of tried to standardize that as much as possible across the, the 10 different experimental labs. Um, and, and now we're recording um, with, uh, with, with neuropixels arrays um, in those mice as they perform this, this, this task. And we're trying to kind of poke, poke around in the brain, you know, taking hundreds of experiments. So we, we really try to cover the, the whole brain and so we can record the activity um, in, in the mouse brain as, as, as the, these mice perform this, this well standardized and, and very reproducible um, decision, decision task. All right. And so, you know, so that's, that's like the, the, the job of the 10 experimental labs. And then we also have 10 theory or analysis labs who are, you know, trying to, trying to make sense of all this data, right? So this is, this is a huge amount of data. It's, it's, it's a huge effort. Um, and here's kind of what, what things look like ideally, right? So, so we have this experimental data that are, that are being kind of recorded. Um, I mentioned that the neuropixels recordings, we're also doing some, some two photon recordings and some fiber photometry recordings. We're also recording behavioral video in, in the animals that are performing this task. <clears throat> and, and basically all of this, you know, big data is, is being processed and, and put up into the cloud for, um, for everyone to, to use. And, and take a look at. And then of course, um, you know, the, the, the analysis labs and the theory labs have all their theories of, of what the brain might be doing. And we're trying to kind of connect those, um, those theories to, to the real data. And then of course, suggest new experiments that, that can be done to, to pursue specific experimental questions that are, are, are related to these, these theories, all right? So, so like I said, some of this data is already available. We, we already have a bunch of um, behavior data that you can you can download, and we've also released a, a, a tiny bit of of EFIS data as well. Just the the recordings from I think just four or so mice so far. Um, we're we're still in the thick of, of recording and kind of quality controlling all these all these EFIS data sets, but but more of that should become available um, over the next year or so. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Go ahead. So the experiments that are the distributed between different labs, depending on the modality. So some labs are doing calcium imaging, some are doing electrophysiology, or is it also mixed? Yeah, great, great question. So, so we've, we've, we kind of have platform papers and individual projects that are, that are done in these labs, right? So the, the first platform paper was, was this behavior paper where, where the 11 experimental labs got this behavior working kind of reproducibly across all the, all the labs and, and did some quantification of, of what the mice are actually doing as part of this task. The second platform paper is, is gonna be this, this EFIS paper where, where we, we release the recordings of, of these neuropixels recordings across, across the whole brain. Um, but then in, in parallel, some, some of the labs are, are pursuing these, these fiber photometry experiments to, to look at specific questions. Some are doing um, wide field um, calcium imaging, some are doing two photon calcium imaging. Um, so, so those, all of the data will, will, will be released, um, but the, the, the large scale platform papers we're starting with are, are, are based on um, Neuropixels EFIS recordings. And following up on that, so the neuropixels, how stable are they in mice now? I think they're quite stable in mice, right? But in, in rats, not so much, or is it the other way around? Yeah. Uh, I'll get to that. 
Um, you know, one of the one of the big kind of meta messages of of this talk is going to be to, to never trust your data. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. So, <laughs> you know, one of the one of the bitter lessons I've learned over over my you know two decades or so in neuroscience is is you can you can make beautiful theoretical models, um, and and when you actually try to tr really closely connect those to to data you start to see issues, right? And, and you need to be extremely careful about, about the data quality as you're thinking about what, what models you can build, what models you can test. Um, so that's, that's gonna be something that I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in the context of, of all these different data types. Um, but the short answer is um, you, can, you can definitely cool, do, do cool things with the, you know, current, current NeuroPixels recordings, but you also need to be careful and, and check the data very carefully. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of our experience with that so far. Any other questions? All right, cool. Um, yeah, like I said, so, so like I said, you can, you can go to this, this website, take a look at the data. Um, and, and yeah, we, we, you know, we would uh, consider it a failure if, if we release this cool data um, and, and no one, no one publishes any papers to, you know, to, to, you know, using, using this data. So we, we hope to, to get as many people using this, this data as possible and, and looking at it in, in a lot of detail and discovering flaws in the data and, and using the data to, to test their own ideas. And, and again, to su suggest new experiments, right? Um, there's, there's lots of, lots of, you know, we, we, we hope that this is kind of a, a platform that, that, you know, can, can be built upon in the, in the coming years to, to, to do new new cool scientific work. Okay, so so like I said, this is this has really been a, a key motivator. Um, another big big issue that we've kind of run into is as part of the the IBL, but but also just more generally, is um, you know the difficulties of. So so my my group and and a lot of other groups obviously are in the business of of developing cool new. Um, analysis methods, cool new machine learning methods that can be applied to, to neural data. Um, and what we've discovered over the years is, is that there's, there's different levels to this, right? You can, um, you can, you can get your, your cool new method working on, on one data set and publish a paper based on that. That's, that's, that's a good new step. Um, it, it turns out to be a lot harder to, to actually make tools that, that other people can use reliably. Um, and it, it turns out to be even harder to, to make tools that, that kind of scale not to a single data set, but to, to multiple data sets, right? Of, of the scale of, of the IBL, for example. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of things going on there, right? One of, one of the basic problems that we have <laughs> when we release new, new analysis tools is, is people find it difficult just to sometimes install the, the tools on their own local machines or, or get things to run or have enough memory on their machines to, to run things. And, and there's, there's, there's a huge amount of kind of time spent on, on just, just getting these, these basic methods working. Um, and, and so we, we kind of, you know, half jokingly refer to this as a infrastructure as grad student, right? I'm sure you all know, you know, you've, you've probably spent a lot of time, you know, trying to get other people's MATLAB code to run or Python code or, you know, installing different Python environments, installing maybe getting, getting GPUs to work nicely on, on your local machine. It's, it's a lot of work. And, you know, we've realized that the, a lot of this work is, is kind of wasted. And, you know, it's, it's 2021. We, there, there should be a better way. Um, so again, this, this work is in collaboration with, with John Cunningham's group. Um, there's a there's a bioarchive paper on on this work. What we've what we what we've tried to set up is a method where um, experimentalists can can come with their data, not not have to install anything in, in Python or on CUDA or anything. They just upload their their data to the cloud um, along with with some configuration files, and then this this platform, this this um, neuroscience cloud analysis platform basically kicks off a few um, instances on, on AWS to process your data in parallel and then it returns the the results and kind of a um, kind of a certificate of, of what was actually done so the, the the analysis is kind of completely reproducible and so this this is set up you can you can use it um, and I, I think this this approach has a lot of advantages right it's it's infinitely scalable if you have a hundred data sets you want to process you can just Upload those all and and kind of process them in, in parallel. Um, you can you can run as many different kind of 
um, settings of your hyperparameters and do hyperparameter search at scale. Um, you don't have to mess around with, with CUDA at all. You don't have to um, you know, install anything. And actually, it turns out to be kind of faster and cheaper to, to run things in the cloud than it is to, to run things locally, typically, um, unless you're really running things kind of around the clock on your, on your local machine. Um, because, because essentially, with this with this cloud platform, you, you just you just rent hardware for 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 just the amount of time you you need to run your analysis. Um, so again, this is this is kind of a new tool that we're hoping that that you know everyone starts to use. Um, we we have a bunch of kind of different different methods that are that are available now. Um, you can you can check out the the, the preprint on, on BioArchive for for more details. And, and for people like, like this crowd who are interested in de developing new, new analysis tools and new, new theories, we also hope that you can kind of bring in your own kind of um, theoretical tools and, and analysis tools and, and you know, make, make those available to, to everyone as, as part of this platform. So we've, we've tried to make it easy, not just for users to use the system, but also for developers. Um, and again, the advantage here is that you know what we found is that if if you if you can get this if you can get your code to work nicely and kind of optimally on on one um, AWS machine instance, then you don't have to support Windows and um, you know OS X and and you know all the other nice operating systems that we have. You just have to get it get it working well on on kind of one machine and then and then you're good to go. So that that makes life easy on the developer side as well. Any questions on on this one? Uh, Liam, uh, yeah. how do you deal with the problem of having uh, basically as many data formats as there are experimental labs? Uh, yeah, that's right. So we've we've kind of punted on that. So so again, this is we, we set up this platform. You can you can upload data of any type to the platform, but if if you want to use one of these methods. Um, you know, like like if you want to use deep lab cut, for example, um, each each of these methods is going to accept um, some format, right? So if, if you want to use this this method, you might you might have to um, record data in that format or or write a little wrapper file to get get your data into that format, and then you're good to go, right? So so some of these methods are going to accept multiple formats, some of them are not, um, but you know we're not in the business of of enforcing different different formats. We kind of leave that to the to the developers of these methods to, to handle that. Um, and, and that that actually hasn't been much of an issue for us so far. Maybe maybe it will be in the future, but but for now that that hasn't been the bottleneck. Great. So let's let's get to, to some science, right? So so one of the one of the big um one of the big things that, that kind of motivated our, our early work in, in calcium imaging analysis was this question of you know can you you know calcium imaging you know became like a, a cool thing maybe a little more than a decade ago, and, and immediately we're like, okay, now we can see the, the nice twinkling of, of lots of cells simultaneously. Maybe we can look at this this you know large scale neural activity and figure out what's connected to what. Right? Can we can we do circuit inference from from functional data? Um, and and you know, and so what are the what are the problems you would need to solve to to make this kind of a reality? Well, you you would need to take the the, the raw data and figure out where all the cells are. Um, if you have any overlapping cells, you're going to need to kind of demix the activity of, of two different cells that lie on top of each other. Uh, you're going to need to kind of extract, you know, we all know that, that the calcium imaging is, is fairly slow, right? Every time the neuron spikes, there's, you know, calcium comes into the cell and then slowly kind of decays back down to some baseline. So you're going to need to run some deconvolution method and, and maybe a denoising method to, to pull out neural activity or try to estimate neural activity from that slow activity. The, the slow fluorescence kind of recordings you, you take. You know, there's there's been a huge amount of work in, in trying to go from lots of spike trains to kind of a circuit model. Um, that's actually something I'm, I'm not going to talk about much today, but I, I think you've you've heard some of these these ideas in some of your other lectures. Um, so you you, you want to take the, these these spike trains and go to something that looks like this, kind of a directed circuit model. And then maybe if you're lucky, you can you can you know hook up with an experimentalist who who's willing to to start to poke these cells with lasers, right? Maybe maybe if you think this cell is connected to this cell, you can you can actually optogenetically stimulate this cell and see if you get a bump of activity in the in the nearby cell. And then hopefully kind of close the loop and then kind of collect more data and do this do this all again, right? So this was this was kind of the the dream experiment that that kind of motivated our work for, for a long time. 
and it's I, I still think it's it's kind of a cool thing to pursue but you know one of the things we we realized over time is that it's it's really hard <laughs> there's there's a lot of things that that have to kind of go right for this to work um and and this this is this is really one of the one of the cases where, where we learned early on that you you really had to pay very close attention to your your data quality or else or else your results are just kind of um very hard to interpret right so for example, if, if you don't solve this demixing problem correctly, if, if you confuse the activity of, of one cell with, with another, you're, you're, you're gonna get kind of mistakes in these arrows here, right? That's, that's pretty clear. So we, we ended up spending a lot of time focusing on, on, on this demixing problem. Um, another issue is, you know, maybe, maybe the activity in this, in this population is, is kind of non-stationary, right? So maybe, um, you know, how do you, how do you deal with, with with, with non-stationarities or, or changes in the SNR of, of this population over time. What do you, what do, you do if, if you're only recording a small bit of the circuit and there's lots of common input coming in from, from the rest of the circuit, right? So there, there are a lot of, again, I, I, I wanna emphasize this. You, you, wanna, you wanna make sure that your, the theories and the computational methods you're, you're, you're working with are trying to, you, you know, you want these to be as, as connected as possible to the, to the real data. And that's, that's a lesson we've, We've learned over the years. Um, so let's let's take a look at you know what what some of this what some of this data actually actually look like. Um, so I, I don't know if you've you've talked much about calcium imaging data before, if you've if you've seen calcium imaging data, but but here's here's an example of, of what some raw data look like. All right, so this is this is a raw video. This is actually taken from Andreas Tolius's lab a few years ago, um, just just to give you a sense of of what this looks like. Right, so you. You have you have a few different components in these in these videos typically, um, so so each of these little blips here corresponds to the activity of, of one cell. If you if you zoom in on this, you can kind of see the 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 soma kind of very very clearly outlined by the flashes of, of this activity. You also see a lot of kind of fuzzy noise. There's there's also sometimes some some kind of background activity where where it looks like a lot of the image is kind of coming up and down together, um, and and you want to kind of build that into your models, right? Um, so the, the basic problem we want to solve here is to separate all these different aspects of the movie apart. There's this, if, if we think of the, the video as, as, as a matrix, we're, we're doing matrix factorization, right? So to be, to be clear, the, the matrix that I mean here could be kind of X by Y by T, or if we kind of vectorize each, each frame of this video into, into a single, um, you know, D by, by T matrix, D is the, the total number of, of pixels in the video and T is the number of time steps. So we wanna take that D by T matrix and, and decompose it into a noise component, maybe a background component, and then also individual components that, that correspond to the, the activity of each of these individual cells that we see, right? So that's, that's kind of what I'm showing over here. We're trying to go from this, this raw video to, to Ideally, something that looks like this, something where we've separated out the background activity, separated out the noise activity, and now we just have, you know, the activity of each of these individual cells, hopefully is, is demixed and localized as, as well as possible. Any, any questions on the basic, basic goals here? All right. So I think, I think a lot of you have probably seen examples of this or maybe even used some of these methods on, on your own data. Um, so, so what are the, you know, what do we have to do with this data? Well, well, like I said, the the kind of dominant paradigm in this field is is this uh, kind of matrix factorization, right? So, so if if I take that video that I showed you on the last slide and and kind of break it up, so we we, we vectorize each each voxel or each pixel, um, so we have you know d pixels down here and t time steps over here. What we end up with. Uh, this is simulated data to be clear, but but real data looks looks similar, just just noisier. We we see something like this, right? So every every kind of stripe here corresponds to the you know a single cell firing. Each each cell covers multiple pixels. It jumps up. The, the calcium level kind of jumps up pretty quickly and then decays down slowly over time. And that's 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 what we're seeing here. And you might have multiple cells kind of overlapping spatially. You know, maybe one cell is slightly behind another in, in space. And when you when you scan your laser across this 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 field of view, um, you know, the the activity of, of those two cells might be combined in, in a few pixels. And so that's that's what's being shown right here. Right, you have a couple a couple cells that kind of overlap spatially, and we want to demix the activity of, of those two cells. Right. All right. So you 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 have this data matrix Y. 
this, this D by T data matrix. And we want to separate this out into lots of other more interpretable matrices, right? We want to separate out the noise and the background and the activity of each of these cells, right? So this, this Y hat is, is what I'm going to think of as this, this cleaned, this, this denoise video, right? And, and that is going to be decomposed into, into smaller components as well, right? So basically what, what, what we model here is that this, this denoise component of, of this video corresponds to the sum over, over all the neurons that are visible in this field of view, right? So R here, this, this R corresponds to the number of, of neurons that are visible. Um, AI of X is the spatial footprint of, of each of those cells, right? So, so I indexes cells here. This is a purely spatial term. Um, so this corresponds to kind of the, the spatial footprint of where the cell is in space. CI of T is a, is a purely temporal term that says, okay, how is this cell's fluorescence, overall fluorescence kind of jumping up and decaying, jumping up and decaying over time, right? So we want to extract all of these spatial footprints and all of these, these temporal terms um, from, the, from the video. And then of course, you know, we know a lot about these, these temporal terms. We know they kind of jump up and decay down and jump up and decay down. So we, we might have an additional kind of model for these, these temporal terms that corresponds to kind of a sparse spike train that's being involved with, with kind of a, maybe an exponential filter or something like that, right? So if you, if you write out everything we know about this, this, this data or all the kind of, you know, the prior knowledge that we have, there's, there's a huge number of constraints that we can impose on this matrix factorization problem and, and use those constraints to, to kind of get better recovery. And, you know, we've developed some, some methods based on this constrained non-negative matrix factorization model. A lot of other people have developed good, good methods that, that you know, are, are kind of variants of this, right? So maybe you have a different way of initializing these different terms, or maybe you have a different noise model, or maybe you have a different kind of model for this kind of large scale background fluctuations. But a lot of the, the, the methods that you've probably seen in the literature are kind of based on this, you know, variants of, of this matrix factorization approach, right? Any, any questions on this, comments? Yeah, I'm just wondering how you distinguish um, the background activity versus the noise activity. Is it based on like, the frequency of the, the That's right. Yeah. So um, let, me, let me go back to that video. Um, I actually used to have some, some slides on this, but uh, well, you can, you can see another example here. Right? So this is, this is another um, rod, rod video right, right here. You can see you know, lots of stuff going on. We've, we've kind of zoomed in here a little bit more on, on, the, on the individual cells. So you can see these individual cells a little more clearly. You can see a lot of shot noise. You also see these stripes that, 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 that sometimes come in as a, as a result of motion correction of, of the data. And, and if you watch this data long enough, um, you, you can kind of see these, these kind of fluctuations of the background, which, which we believe is, is probably a result of, of you know, axonal input coming in and, and, and hitting lots of these cells simultaneously. And the axons are so small that we can't actually you know, see their shapes at the, the, the resolution of the two photon microscope and at, at the, the resolution these, these data are, are taken at. Um, and so this, this is kind of an example of this background activity that we've tried to extract. There's, there's a lot of stuff kind of going on in the background, but we, we try to distinguish that from, from the, in, the, the, the activity of these individual cells. So yeah, the question is, how do we actually do that? Um, it's, it's a little bit heuristic, right? These, these, these background components are, are, are you know, going to be the, the, the sum of, of the activity of, of multiple cells typically, or, or, or kind of a widespread array of, of, of axons coming in and, and hitting this, 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 this little population of cells. Um, people have tried different things. Um, as, as you said, maybe there's a spatial frequency dependence of the background that's different from the, 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 the individual components. Um, obviously, individual components tend to be much more localized than this kind of large scale background activity. Um, there, there are a few kind of, kind of tricks that people have used um, to, to try to get at this. Um, but, but I think there's actually you know, more work that could be done there to, to really nail that down. Um, so that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I should also say that you know there's there's lots of different data types available. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show a couple. This is you know kind of standard two photon data. That's that's where you, where you zoom in. Um, you know typically in a you know in a in a head fixed mouse and you can zoom in and, and look at these cells in great detail. There's also um, one photon imaging where you stick a little camera on a on a mouse's head and let it run around. Um, that data looks very different from this two photon data. 
I'm not going to get into the, the details of that in, in this talk, but, but it turns out that you need a wildly different background model for that, that 1P data than you do for the, the, the 2P data, just because of the, the, the details of the imaging and, and the way that the, you know, the fluorescence actually gets, gets onto your, your imaging apparatus is, is pretty different. So you, you do need a very different model for, for that data. Um, we'll, we'll see some, some data in a little while that corresponds to voltage imaging or, or dendritic imaging, and you need different, different kind of models for those, those types of data. So that's, that's a great, great question. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. All right. So, so like I said, we've, we've been, you know, trying to develop and, and kind of optimize these, these um, matrix factorization methods for a long time. One of the things you should know about, about non-negative matrix factorization is, is that it turns out to be an NP hard problem, which is kind of bad news. Um, so like I said, all of these different methods try to try to use different different heuristics based on based on what we know about the real data to kind of initialize these methods well and, and kind of pull out a, a, a good solution. Um, what we realized a couple of years ago is, is that you know a simpler approach, um, you know thinking about you know easier mathematical problems that we can apply to matrix factorization a simpler approach is based on pca right so we know that pca is 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 not an np hard problem you can just run pca on whatever data you like and get a nice answer pretty quickly um, what pca does is is it, it's not going to give you the individual components of these these individual neurons but what it is very good at is is kind of compressing your data into a lower dimensional space where the search for these components is actually going to be much faster, right? So that's that's something else we've worked on in the past couple of years. Um, we developed kind of a, a, a souped up version of PCA. So it turns out that, that applying PCA to the raw data is, is probably not exactly what you want to do. It doesn't take advantage of, of everything we know about these signals. But if, if you apply kind of a penalized version of PCA locally in each little block of your data, um, you're able to, to actually get get a, a very good compression and denoising of the data, uh, which, is, which is shown right here. Okay, so we've, we've developed this kind of penalized matrix decomposition. Think of it as, as just a, a fancier version of PCA, which is more matched to the, the, the data properties here. Um, and, and if you apply that, that penalized matrix decomposition to this raw data, you get something like this. And the great thing about this data, you can see it's, 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 much, it's much cleaner than this data. It's also much smaller, right? So this, this data lives in a, in a subspace, which is 100 times smaller than, than the raw data. And what that means is that you can, you can pass this data back and forth more easily to your friends. You can share data. You can store data much more cheaply. And you can actually run these, these fancier NMF methods um, much faster on, on this, this compressed data. So, so typically, even, even large data sets will now fit in, in GPU. And now you can run your, your favorite demixing algorithms very, very quickly on this, on this compressed data. Um, so that's, that's kind of an important kind of trick we've, we've learned over the years. If, if you kind of, if you can take this, this raw data and compress it into a, a much lower dimensional feature representation, you can, you can kind of do cool new things with, with the data. So this is an example of that. Any questions on this or should I, should I go ahead? All right, cool. All right. So let's, let's, let's go ahead. Um, I mentioned, you know, there's there's lots of different types of, of of imaging data these days. This is a beautiful example from from the Hillman Lab at Columbia, where they're actually imaging in 3D, not just 2D. Um, and what we're looking at here is is the raw 3D data just just max projected into two different dimensions, right? So here's here's a where we're looking at a, a little 3D volume of of cortex. Here's kind of the top view of that 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 bunch of cortex and, and really layers, the, the really layer one of the cortex looking down upon it. Here's a side view where we've projected kind of into the, the side. So you see all these, these beautiful apical dendrites kind of coming in from, from, from the bottom of the brain here up to the top of the brain. And again, the game is, is to try to take this, this raw 3D data and decompose it into, into background and noise and the individual kind of neural components. Um, and so a lot of these, these, these NMF methods that I was discussing on the last slides can be adapted to, to this kind of data. Um, this is just, uh, I, find this, I find this video very common and, and nice to look at. It's like watching a fireworks display. Excuse me. Can you tell us what are referring to the mapping of the color, the activity? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat uh, that? 
matching up colors with less duty in the to central. Yeah, so I think the question was about how do these colors correspond to what's going on in the, in the raw data? So all we've done here is we've just assigned a different color to each of the components that we've pulled out of the data. So we've pulled a, a few hundred components, um, these, these A times C components out of the data that, that hopefully correspond to single cells, or, and, um, and, and we just assigned a different, different color to each of, those, each of those components, just so we can visualize the, the activity here. Thanks. Okay, so, so I've been talking about calcium imaging data so far. Um, the other big advance that's happened you know, over the last decade, um, but, but has really accelerated over the last couple of years is, is the technology for, for imaging voltage directly in the brain, right? So um, again, a, you know, just a, a brief reminder of the biophysics here, calcium imaging doesn't image neural activity directly. Instead, you get this kind of indirect um, readout of activity based on the, the influx of calcium and then, and then the kind of slow extrusion of, of calcium um, in, in individual cells. So the advantage is it's, it's, it's a nice bright signal that you can pull out. You can image lots of cells simultaneously. You can label these cells molecularly so you know what the, the different cell types are. Um, you can image these cells over multiple days in a lot of cases. So calcium imaging is a, is a great technique but it's, it's limited in that it, it doesn't image the, the, the raw voltage of, of these cells directly. So what people have been working on is this kind of, you know, very clever, very hard protein imaging, protein engineering to, to develop proteins that will be inserted into the, the, the cell membrane now instead of living within the cytosol. You put these, these proteins into the cell membrane, and then the hope is that these, these, these proteins will, will change their fluorescence based on the transmembrane voltages, right? So these are direct readouts of the voltages of, of these cells. Uh, yeah, isn't that going to affect the properties of the neurons you're studying? Oh yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is kind of the, the, the bleeding edge. Um, and so yeah, maybe if, if you're not careful, if you put too many, if you pump too many of these proteins into the, the, the membrane, maybe you're gonna change the electrical properties of, of the cell. Maybe you're gonna change the health of the cell overall. There, there's all kinds of issues here that, that again, you need to be pretty careful about. <coughs> and so if you read these voltage imaging cells, you know, typically the, the last, <laughs> the last figure in the paper is, is always like a beautiful image of, of the, the voltage imaging that you can do. But the, the first five figures are all about, well, here's, here's how, the, here's how the, this new protein is expressed on the cell. Here's a, a figure showing that I, I don't think I, I hurt the, the health of the cell. Here's, here's an image showing, you know, kind of ground truth comparisons of the, you know, electrical activity recorded, you know, intracellularly versus the, the voltage readout that I get from the, these, these images. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard work and you, you definitely want to be cautious about that. That's, that's a great point. Um, another big issue, uh, well, well, there are a lot of issues with this data. So it's, it's targeting what we want. It's targeting the, the, the language of these cells, the, the raw voltage on these cells. Um, but, but there are a couple of disadvantages, right? First, you have to image much faster, right? So voltage fluctuations are on the order of milliseconds, whereas calcium fluctuations are on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. So, so to capture these voltage signals, you have to, you have to image about 100 times faster. So this, this data that I'm showing here, which is from a, a paper from a couple of years ago now, is, is taken at, at one kilohertz, right? So you have to have very fast cameras. The, the data set sizes explode. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Um, another issue is that because the, the voltage sensing proteins are targeted to the, to the kind of two-dimensional surface of the cell rather than the three-dimensional volume within the cell, um, it turns out that, that the, they're, they're just basic kind of, you know, the, 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 the voltage sensors, sensors are, are, are going to be lower SNR than the calcium sensors for the foreseeable future, right? It's, you just have to accept that these, these signals are much noisier than, than you might be used to seeing with, with calcium signals. So that's, that's shown up here, okay? This is, this is actually the raw data taken from, from one of these experiments. And if you, if you stare at these cells for a long time, you don't see anything at all. Um, you, you really need to, to do some processing to start to see the, the fluctuations of, of voltage in, in these cells, just because the SNR is, is much lower. So, so what we did to go from here to here is, is simply kind of extract um, an estimate of, of the, 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 the baseline fluorescence, but basically just extract out the, the, the local mean from, from the left panel to get to this. And now, now you can start to see some, some quick flashes of, of activity, but, but they're very, very noisy, right? 
So, so again, it's, it's, it's pretty critical with this voltage data to, to apply some kind of denoiser to it so, so that you can actually start to see the, 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 the voltage fluctuations. And that's, that's what we're showing here, right? So this is this penalized matrix decomposition applied to this, this you know, detrended raw data. And now finally, you can, you can start to see things that are, that are going on here, all right? And what you see if you start to stare at these, these data, um, is a, a few different artifacts. Um, so, so you don't just see the nice flashing of, of individual cells. You actually can, can see kind of the, the motion of, you know, as, as this mouse moves around, you start to see kind of little fluctuations and kind of the, the shape of these cells, which you, you don't want to see if, if you're kind of, um, if, if you have kind of a well-stabilized prep. So you have to deal with motion artifacts. That's, that's very important. Um, you also see, if, if you look at this, this panel, you can see it very clearly. You see these, these little diagonal stripes in your data. And, you know, what, what that is, you might think, oh, that's, that's a cool kind of spike traveling along the dendritic tree, and I'm, I'm going to be able to study uh, backpropagation, and that's, that's going to be really cool. That's not what this is. These are actually blood vessels, right? So what, what, we're, what we're seeing here is actually the, the flow of individual very small blood cells flowing past your field of view. And if you don't handle that, that contamination properly, it's going to completely confound any downstream analysis you want to do of, of the, the subthreshold fluctuations. And, you know, maybe you want to understand how, how this spike over here affects this, this cell over here. You need to be very careful about these, these artifacts in the data before you, before you get to those kinds of analyses. Um, and again, these are things that you, you just wouldn't even be able to see in the raw data. Um, you, you need to perform some kind of denoising before you can even, even see these artifacts in your data. So it's, it's, it's very important to be careful here. All right. So if you're careful about that, if you kind of mask out these, these blood signals and if you regress out these, these, these motion signals, finally you can get to something that, that kind of hopefully is, is close to kind of a, a simultaneous sub-threshold recording of, of multiple cells simultaneously in vivo. So now the hope is that we can start to do some, some cool science with, with these methods. And some of that is, is kind of described in these papers that have started to, to come out from, from multiple labs now. Any, any questions on this? So on the graph on the right, are you able to define spikes? Are these are simply subthreshold. Yeah, are you able to classify spikes in this, or these are all subthreshold? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, I didn't kind of walk through the, the full story here. So, so we perform these different kind of denoising steps, and then finally we, we run this, this kind of matrix factorization step to, to pull out the individual activity of, of these cells. And so what's, what's being shown over here, this is the, the spatial footprint of this cell down here. And this is the, the, the temporal kind of trace that we pull out corresponding to this cell. All right, so you, you see some kind of subthreshold stuff and occasionally you see some kind of spiky things. And, and then the question is, okay, is that a spike or is that just kind of an artifact? And you need to be careful about that. Here's, here's another one where you can kind of very clearly see um, a little bit of axon and a little bit of dendrite coming off of the cell. Um, and, and these spikes, you know, if you, if you kind of stare at this, this video and go back and forth and look at what the cell is actually doing there, you can kind of convince yourself that these, these blips actually correspond to, to, to spikes probably. And so you can look at each of these, these components individually and, and go back and forth. And you know, we, we call this a, a demixing video where we've tried to decompose the, the raw data in the, into these different components. Um, and then you know, try to be careful and convince yourself that what you're seeing is, is, is real and not just a, you know, some kind of artifact of, of demixing or some, some other thing that's going on in your data. Um, and, and so, yeah, you have to be very careful about kind of performing these visualizations and, and checking checking to, to make sure that you, you think that what's, what's going on here is, is kind of correct. Um, but there's, there's no ground truth for these data sets. You know, it's, it's not like we could stick five electrodes into these cells and check that they're all, all, all correct. Um, you, can, you can stick kind of one electrode at a time in and, and, and try, to, try to make sure that you're, you're getting kind of the, the correct signals out, but, but, but it's impossible to kind of ground truth at, at scale for these, for these videos. Did that, did that address your question a little bit? Yeah. Also, for example, the motion graph—it seems very ambiguous. It's very spikes and lines with fluctuation. Yeah, that's right. So for some of these cells, it's it's hard to tell what's what's super threshold and what's what's sub threshold, right? So, um, 
that's, that's just, you know, we've, we've tried as hard as we could, you know, the protein engineers and the physiologists and, and kind of the, the data analysis working together have, you know, this is, <laughs> this is as good as we've gotten this, this cell to be at this point. Um, but, but I will say, you know, the technology is, is marching forward, right? People, people are, you know, every, every few months, there's kind of a new iteration on these, on these voltage sensors. So it's, it's definitely getting better. Um, so if, if you look at something like this, and again, this is a couple of years ago now, if you look at something like this and say, well, that's, that's not the SNR that, that I want to be dealing with, you know, check, check back in and, and, in a few months or a year or two, and then hopefully the, you know, these spikes will, will get, get higher and higher over time. So, so that's, that's definitely a work in progress. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where, where things are in the voltage imaging world. Um, one, one more thing I wanted to kind of discuss before we move this, this calcium imaging stuff is, uh, <clears throat> I guess I need to, to speed things up a little bit, um, is, you know, that I mentioned this, this question of ground truthing, right? So, so how do you know if, if the signals that you're extracting and the shapes that you're extracting actually correspond to kind of, you know, the, the, the real underlying kind of microanatomy of, of these cells. Um, so there's been a lot of effort there, but, but it's been pretty unsatisfying. So people have, have taken videos and then kind of hand labeled cells in their videos and, and then tried to compare those hand labeled cells to the output of these different algorithms. I think that's a good step, but it's clearly incomplete because we know that two different hand labelers will, will kind of label different different cells, right? And and these hand labelers tend to be biased towards towards somas and they kind of miss all the interesting little dendritic bits that you might see in these in these videos. So that 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 kind of hand labeling work has, has always been a little bit unsatisfying. Um, something else you can do is, is shown here. Um, what you can do is, is record a calcium imaging movie in, in, in a mouse and then take that that volume of, of mouse brain and slice it up really, really thin, um, put it through a, an electron microscope and then run, you know, your favorite modern segments are on that, on that EM data to pull out individual cells and then try to map those individual EM cells back onto the, the, the functional 2P data stack that you, you collected. And then try to, try to check your results that way, right? Um, so that, that gets us closer to what, what I think of as, as a, I don't want to call it ground truth, but it's it's closer to a gold standard that we can kind of really really objectively kind of kind of rank these different algorithms on. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is is try to actually use these shapes that you've extracted from the EM data, use those as priors for for what your cells should look like, and then try to extract even cleaner representations of of the the neural activity using those 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 prior those strong prior information about about where the cells are. Okay, so this I'm, I'm summarizing kind of a, a large multi-year collaboration um, that we've we've just played a small part in. Um, so my lab has been involved in trying to make this connection between the the segmented EM data, which is an, an extremely hard problem that's been kind of represents a decade's worth of work in in, in that community. Um, take take those those beautiful EM segmented cells and match them and, and use them as as priors to to extract even cleaner calcium signals from from these brains. Okay. And again, you can you can check out the, the details of that. Again, it's it's all based on this this matrix factorization approach, but but using the EM information as as priors on these spatial components that we're going to pull out of this data. Okay, so so if if you run that analysis, you you get you know this 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 beautiful. It's always kind of chokes my, my my poor little laptop here, but but you can you can see basically simultaneously the activity of of this small neural circuit along with the the full kind of um, microanatomy, right? So you can see where all these cells are. You can actually see which cells are connected to each other, and you can map that calcium imaging. Um, those, those, those flashes of activity that you get from the calcium imaging data, you can map that back onto this, this, this microcircuit to, to really connect the, the function of the circuit to the, to the structure. Um, so I think there's, you know, there, there was just another big data release from, from this, this collaboration. Um, again, if you check out, you know, microns.explore.org, you can, you can get this raw data and there's, there's a huge number of, of cool scientific questions to, to be addressed here. Um, so I think that's going to open up a, a lot of a lot of cool new work. Um, just just to close the the, the loop on that, um, to give you a sense of, of of what these what these cells actually look like as you translate between the the EM and the the two P imaging. Um, in this case, we the the, the experimentalist image kind of across multiple multiple sessions, they they, they took multiple planes of of two P data um, from this from this brain volume. 
Um, and then our job, like I said, is to kind of extract those 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 AIs, those those spatial footprints, and then try to try to map those back onto the underlying kind of micronet. Right. So here I'm showing the the, the segmented cell, a single segmented cell out of out of hundreds out of this out of this little volume. Um, I should say hundreds of, of, of cells that include so many cells. There's actually hundreds of thousands of little axonal bits that course through this, this small, small volume. Um, and then what we're trying to do here again is we, we start with the EM mesh. Then we say, OK, if, if I were to, to use a two photon imaging microscope to, to take a little slice of this data, what would this, what would this EM mesh actually look like? So we can kind of generate kind of predictions of you know, if, if this cell was completely filled with calcium indicator in a uniform way, um, this, is, this is what you know, this, this image is what a single slice through that cell would look like. And then if we compare this kind of predicted image to, to this, what we get out of the actual calcium imaging data, what we see is, you know, as, as desired, this, this footprint lives within this, this cell, right? There's no leakage of, of calcium indicator outside of the cell. That's, that's good. But it turns out that this, this, this calcium footprint always lies within kind of a, a, a strict subset of, of the potential volume of, of the cell. So basically the, you know, the, the bright parts of the cell are just gonna be kind of a subset of, the, of what's, what's predicted by this, this EM mesh. And if we collect that information across, across multiple cells recorded in, in this volume, again, we, we have this kind of gold standard um, you know, data set of, 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 of these calcium shapes now, right? So, so the brightest 10 calcium shapes shown on, you know, three of these, of these slices are shown here. Um, the next 20 are shown here. The next 30 are shown here. Um, and, and so finally you get down to this, this really small stuff that you, you, you probably wouldn't have, have been, been able to pull out if you didn't have strong prior information about, about where these dendrites were kind of coursing through the, um, the, the, the imaging planes here. Um, and the interesting thing to me here is that these these somas, these big bright somas that the people were picking out in these in these kind of human labeled data sets, really comprise just about twenty percent of the components that you can you can pull out of this out of this data. There's there's a huge amount of signal that you can extract um, beyond just the big bright bright somas. So that's that's kind of an important kind of take home message here. And now of course now that you have these 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 gold standard kind of um, you know cell shapes, you can use those to train fancier denoising methods, fancier methods for, for demixing very, very dense data. Um, there's, there's a lot of cool, cool new things we can, we can do now downstream. And did the, um, as you're doing the, as you're assigning it to the somas and the axon through the different parts of the, of the EM reconstruction, does it, does it fit with what you'd expect, like that the activity follows? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of a, a, a big part Oops, that's that's kind of a big part of this paper, you know, trying to trying to convince ourselves and kick the tires of this method and, and kind of kind of establish that that these 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 footprints that we're pulling out of the data kind of match the the, the EM you know priors very well. Um, and, and again, to be clear, in, in this case, they have to, right? We've we've constrained the the matrix factorization so that um, so so again, each of these footprints actually live within the the predicted EM footprints, right? Because because in this case, we're interested in trying to extract out that the, the temporal temporal activity of these cells as as accurately as possible. Um, what we haven't done much of actually, and, and what we should do more of, is is take the the different algorithms that are out there, run them kind of just just directly and then go ahead and try to try to match things back to these 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 ground truth or these gold standard 2p footprints and um, that's that's something we haven't had time to do but i think it would be a, a great a great project to pursue in the future we just spent a lot of time talking about voltage data and calcium data and this this new em kind of calcium imaging data um i should say that you know well, well, what I, what I wanted to do in, in this talk is, is talk about kind of three three types of data. There was the, the imaging data that we just spent a lot of time on. Um, I wanted to talk about behavioral video data, and I also wanted to talk about um, electrophysiology data. These these neural pixel recordings. Um, I was I was targeting an hour and a half. Um, yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll just go ahead. And if if you guys get get bored or if you want to hear one thing or another, just tell me to speed up, and I'm I'm happy to kind of adjust adjust my pace as I go, all right? So, so I guess the, 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 the second big kind of you know, type of data that we've been really occupied with over the last few years is, is this behavioral video data. Um, 
it's it's become very clear that you know if so so if you go back to that 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 first IBL paper that I, I mentioned the behavior paper where we we kind of take take this fixed behavior across across multiple experimental labs and try to compare the behavior of, of multiple mice um, that that whole paper was really based on very simple readouts of, of the mouse's behavior, right? So in this, in this IBL task, you, you see this, this head fixed mouse that has to kind of, this is a little Lego wheel. It has to roll this Lego wheel back and forth to kind of make a decision based on what, what it's seeing on the screen. So it's playing a little visual video game um, and it's, it's, it's behavior on each, on each trial can be seen as, as just a simple binary thing. Should I go left or should I go right? Right? It's, it's a very simple kind of two alternative force choice task. And, and so if you, if you just look at that single binary output per trial, you can, you can do a lot, right? You can, you can make a lot of cool models based on that, on that binary output. But if you look at what the mouse is actually doing, there's, there's actually a huge amount of stuff that's going on that's, that's not just directly related to this binary output, or that might be correlated to this binary output or, or to the mouse's priors about what's going on in this task. But there's, there's obviously a huge rich set of information that, that is, is gonna be driving lots of neurons in this mouse's brain. And if, if, if we throw this, this information away, we're gonna, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna miss out on a lot of cool stuff that's going on in the brain, right? And it's become very clear that these these little movements of of the of the mouse's whiskers and the licking and the little kind of movements of of this, this the the paw that it's it's doing have a huge impact, kind of an outsized impact on the activity of 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 neurons throughout the brain, not not just in kind of the motor areas of the brain, but also in the visual areas and the, the auditory areas and really throughout the brain. And so we 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 want to extract as much information from these these videos as possible. Um, and there's been some really nice work on, on this problem over the last few years, right? So probably a lot of you have, have heard of deep, deep lab cut or have used this, this method. Basically what you, what you do is you take some video, you, you add a few labels to, to the mouse's paw or the pupil or the nose. You train a little neural network that, that kind of tries to identify those, those objects from, from video. And then you throw this at, at you know, a lot of test frames video and, and you're able to kind of track the mouse's behavior over time, right? So that's, that's a, a beautiful piece of computer vision technology that wasn't available five years ago. And it's made a huge difference in, in the way we approach um, a lot of questions in neuroscience. So that's been extremely impactful. Um, so we've, we've been using Deep Lab Cut as part of the, the IBL. Um, and, and what we've realized is, is that, you know, as, as you go again from the, the activities the, the, the recordings in, in a single lab to the recordings, you know, to, to hundreds of sessions across a dozen or so labs, it turns out that, that you know, methods that work really nicely in, in, in one session don't work at all on, on multiple sessions. So this has been kind of a, another bitter lesson that we've learned, right? So you actually have to work very hard to, to get these methods to work at scale. Um, and so we've, we've been interested in, in, in ways of, of improving these methods and scaling them up. Um, I, I mentioned this, this Neurocast platform that's been a big part of, of, of how we kind of approach these problems these days. Um, so you can see what's going on here. This, this is after actually, actually labeling more than 10,000 frames. So, so a pretty large number of frames at this point. And, and if you stare at these videos for long enough, you'll, you'll still see kind of issues that we don't wanna be there, right? Sometimes, sometimes the, the, the right paw marker hops over to the left paw, or sometimes when, when, the, um, when the animal kind of hides its paw back here, you'll, you'll, you'll lose tracking completely. You see kind of glitches in the data where, where you know, the, the, the marker kind of jumps in a bad way, and that's gonna spoil any, any downstream kind of temporal segmentation methods that we want to use. Um, so we really need to, to, to try to make these methods work, work more robustly. That's, that's still a pretty, pretty open problem. Any, any questions on this? Maybe, maybe some of you have, have used Deep Lab Cut or something similar and have experiences to share? I don't know. It's a bit painful to use, but it's okay. <laughs> What's that? It was a bit painful the time I used it. There was a lot of labeling. It was more of labeling. Lots of labeling. Yeah, that's 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 been <laughs> it's been our experience as well. All right, so so one of the things we've been very interested in is you know can we can we improve these methods, right? So, you know one of the 
one of the big trends in, in computer vision generally is, is, is moving from fully supervised methods to either unsupervised or, or semi-supervised methods, right? So, so deep lab cut is a fully supervised method. You, you take a bunch of frames, you add your labels, you train your neural network just based on those labels, and then you hope that the neural network is smart enough at that point to handle all the other unlabeled frames in your, in your data set. And sometimes it works great, and sometimes it, it doesn't work so, so well. So here's, here's an example where it's not working so well. This, this is, is a pretty small labeled data set. To, we were trying to track these, these fingers. I think we, we have on the order of, of 100 or so labels on these fingers. Um, so not, not very many. Um, but you see that clearly that's, that's just not enough, right? If, if you wanted to track these, these fingers over time, you know, kind of every time the, the, the mouse moves a little bit, you, you kind of lose, lose tracking. So this, this, this just didn't work at all. Um, for us, at least without going to the effort of, of adding lots and lots of, of, of more labels. Okay, so, so you, can, you can do a few things here, right? You can think about active learning strategies where you, you, you kind of train a little, you, 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 you label some data, you train a model, you look at the errors that the, the model is making, and then you try to correct those errors specifically, and then you train again, and you iterate back and forth until you end up with a good model, right? And that's, that's kind of I think that's a very good approach. It's, it's kind of baked into the, the deep lab cut philosophy. Um, and so that's, that's one way you can, you can improve these methods. A different way you can improve these methods is, is to pull in you know, other unsupervised or weak supervised signals, right? So what, what do we actually know about these, these videos, right? There's, there's a huge amount of spatial and temporal kind of constraints that you can bake into these, into these models and use them to, to train a, a stronger model, right? So, so for example, we know that the, the, the fingers on the paw are, are never gonna be too far apart, right? We're, we're never gonna find a, a, a pinky finger down here and an index finger up here, right? That, that never happens. So one thing we can do as we're training our model is if it makes mistakes like that, if it puts the pinky finger down here and the index finger up here, we can impose a penalty that says, no, you, you shouldn't be doing that. You should learn not to do that over your, over your training iterations. Um, bake that into the model so that it, it has this, this extra kind of unsupervised signal that it can use to, to learn, a, hopefully, a better tracker, right? So pay attention to the labels, right? Learn, learn based on those labels. Take gradient steps based on, 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 on that supervised loss, but also have this unsupervised loss that says, OK, there, there are going to be constraints on how far apart these, these fingers can be. Right. The other big constraint here is that the, the mouse's hand never, never teleports from one point to another. Right? It, it always kind of moves, moves smoothly, assuming that you have a high enough frame rate as, as part of your raw data. Right? So you can impose a temporal constraint as well. Right? Never, never let my, my thumb jump from one part of the screen to another from frame to frame. And if that happens, impose a penalty and train the, the model to do a better job. Right? So if you stick in those, those spatial and temporal penalties as, as part of your training, you can, you can train a stronger model. And that's, that's what's shown here. This is, this is a paper that came out, I guess, last year, showing that this, this simple, simple approach works, works pretty well, actually. So this is using exactly the same training data set, but, but adding in these, these new unsupervised losses as part of the, the training. And you end up with, with tracking that is certainly not perfect, um, but it's, it's significantly better than the, than the supervised only training that we, we see above, right? And then these, these other traces just correspond to, you know, we're tracking the one finger, two finger, three finger, four finger down here. So you can kind of take a look at, at where, these, where these glitches happen in DLC and, and you know, see if this new semi-supervised method actually corrects some of those glitches over time. And, and it turns out that it does. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one way you can improve things. Um, There's this unsupervised loss and the supervised loss and how are they combined during training? Is it like so, so yeah, that's that's a great question. So I'm going to skip the the math here. What what we used in this paper was um, kind of a, a, a stochastic variational inference approach to to learn this model. So we we basically have a latent variable that says, you know, the corresponds to the pose that we're trying to track. So we have in this case, it's going to be an, an eight dimensional latent variable because we're tracking four fingers and we we have the x and y for for each of those fingers. So we have an eight dimensional latent for each frame. And then we impose, you know, we, we, we have kind of a graphical model that, that imposes these constraints on, on each of the fingers and each of the relationships of the fingers from, from frame to frame. 
Um, so we have a graphical model that, that imposes those constraints, and then we also pull in the information from each, each image, right? So the neural network is, is getting information from each image, and that further constrains these latent variables. And then we use, you know, kind of pretty standard graphical model variational inference to actually train, train this model. So the, those details are, are described here. I, I, think, I think a lot of that can be simplified quite a bit. We don't need that, that heavy kind of kind of Bayesian machinery. Um, so we're, we're actually playing with, with simpler versions of, of this, this method now um, that, that will hopefully kind of be, be faster and, and easier to adapt to different, different needs. So we're hoping to release kind of a, an updated version of, of this, this code pretty soon. All right, so this, this is one kind of simple way of, of improving these methods. Um, there are other, other things you can do, right? So, so I mentioned this, this active learning approach. Um, so one, one thing that you know is, is very well known, you know, if, if you look at the, the old school deep learning literature from um, you know, decades ago, people, people realized very early on that if you train the same model with the same data set, but just, just randomize the order of, of the, the, the training steps that you take, you can get different models, right? These are, these are wildly over-parameterized models that are caught in these, these weird local optima that we still don't really understand. Um, so if you, if, you, if you train an ensemble of, of neural networks, instead of just training a single neural network, you train 10 neural networks using either different hyperparameters or different training orders, you're, you're gonna get networks that make different mistakes. And, and those, those mistakes are gonna be kind of idiosyncratic in a way we don't really understand very well. But we don't need to understand it. What we can do is just, just train those networks and then, you know, for example, take the median over, over the output of, of those different networks and, and kind of for free, you get better tracking, right? So this is, this is a, a very well-known phenomenon in the, the kind of old school deep, deep learning literature. Um, and of course, this is something that's, that's trivial to do on, on AWS, right? It would, it would be something you wouldn't want to do if you just had one local GPU that's going to kind of burn up um, training, training these 10 networks over and over and over again. But if, if you have access to, to 10 GPUs on the cloud, you can just, you can just do this kind of trivially. Um, and it, it works, right? As, as you'd expect based on this, this decades old literature, um, training an ensemble and using the ensemble to do the tracking actually leads to significantly more, more robust tracking with, with fewer glitches over time. Um, the other cool thing you can do is, is use the ensemble to find bad frames, right? So, so if you look at where, where one network and one, one member of the ensemble and a different member of the ensemble disagree, that's, that's actually a pretty good um, candidate for, for active learning, right? For, for putting in more, more supervised signals so that you, you, you teach these two networks to actually agree on those frames. So if, if you're doing one of these active learning loops, um, it's, it's very useful to, um, to search, for, search for frames where, where two of your ensemble members are, are, are saying wildly different things. Um, so that's, we, we found that that's, that's pretty useful and that can lead to actually, actually faster training as well. All right, so this is kind of a, a simple old school idea. Um, it's, it's not very deep, uh, no pun intended, um, but it's, it's, it's very useful and it's, it's kind of trivial to, to deploy um, if, if you're working in the cloud instead of kind of limited to, to your local, local machine. All right, so that's, that's an easy one. Um, what else? What else? Can we do to improve here? Well, one of the one of the questions that we've always had with these methods is, you know, is it is it extracting all the information that that, that we care about, right? So so can we pull out more information from these videos that could be used to to build richer encoding models or richer decoding models as as we go into the brain and look at the the, the neural activity, um, or is it sufficient just to track the paw and track the nose and track the the, the pupil diameter? Right, so that's that's a question we can we can ask directly. Right, one one thing you can do is is run your favorite autoencoder on this raw data. You know, basically take take raw frames, map those frames into a low dimensional space, and train the those low dimensional latents to to basically capture as much information in the raw data as possible. Right, so that when you actually push push these low dimensional latents through a decoding network back into the original data space, you want the reconstructed frames here, it's matched the original frames as, as well as possible, right? So PCA would be the kind of linear version of this where you have um, a linear encoder and a linear decoder. Of course, you can do better if, if you 
swap in those those linear mappings with 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 nonlinear neural networks. Um, and so this is this is something we looked at a couple of years ago. Turns out to work very well. You can you can actually you know compress these these videos down into a, a very low dimensional space, say ten or so dimensions, and capture most of what's what's visible in these in these videos. Um, so that's cool. Um, but then we thought, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe these, you know, can I, can I do better if, if, if I have additional information, right? You know, a lot of the games we play here come, come down to, you know, what do I, what do I, what priors do I have? What do I know about the, the raw data that I can kind of build into my model to, to get better performance of, of whatever analysis method I'm, I'm thinking of? And so here, you know, if we've, if we've gone to the trouble of, of labeling 10,000 frames and we've got trackers that work pretty well, why don't I pull that information in and, and use it to, to train a better kind of compression, right? So there are lots of different ways you could, you could think about doing this. Um, the way we've been pursuing recently is, is to use the, use the supervised information, right? Use the tracker that we've already gone to the trouble of, of training to basically say, okay, I'm... I, I want to make sure that my encoder pulls out enough information to reconstruct the the, the 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 tracking, right? I still want to be able to do good tracking on these videos, but but I want to get other stuff as well, right? So there might be, you know, maybe the the animal moves its shoulder in a funny way, in a way that's not captured by the movements of the paw, or maybe it wiggles its its whiskers in a way that's not captured by 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 the licking or the, the nose movement signal that we're, we're we're tracking, right? So there's probably other stuff that's that's maybe a little bit orthogonal to these, these supervised signals that I'm tracking. And it'd be awesome if I could pull that out of the data as well, right? So you can, you can make, I'm sure there are lots of different ways of doing this, but the way we did this is, is, is we made an encoder. Again, we're, we're trying to take, take the raw, the very high dimensional raw video frames, map those into a lower, lower dimensional space. Um, and, and what we wanted this low dimensional space to do is, is to do kind of a couple different things simultaneously. We wanted to be able to, to, to push that, that low dimensional latent. We wanted to split that into two parts, right? There's, there's a supervised part, which is responsible for having enough information to reconstruct the, the tracking, right? So we wanna make sure we're able to do that. And then there's an unsupervised part that, that corresponds to kind of everything else we wanna extract from the video. Right, so we want to be able to push the the supervised bits and the unsupervised bits together into a single decoder that that actually capture the raw data, right? And and you know we, we put together a couple loss functions that, that that do this, and that's that's um, that's that's described in this paper that you can check out. Is that all pretty clear? And you know, what we're trying to do here and what the what the goals are? More yeah. or less. Okay. Cool. So so now we can say well. Are we doing a good job, right? And so you can do do standard things like like look at how well you're able to reconstruct the frames as a function of the dimensionality of, of these terms. You can look at how well we 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 extract the the, the supervised tracking that we had before. Um, what we really want to do though is is take a look at the these these latents that we we pull out and try to understand what they're actually encoding, right? So so one thing that we found very useful is is again kind of a classical technique. From the autoencoder literature called kind of latent traversals, right? So we want to we want to take take an image, extract its latent variables, and then hold those fixed, and just change one of those at a time, and then push the resulting perturb latents back through your decoder and see what changes in the image, right? And if if we're able to get kind of a, a good representation of a good low dimensional informative representation of, of, of these images, we should be able to kind of perturb these, these individual signals in a way that, that makes sense when we go back to the, the original image space, okay? So here's, here's kind of an example of that. Um, apologies for this, this scary kind of zoomed in mouse eyeball here. Um, but, but we took a single frame from, from our zoomed in um, camera we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, obviously the zoomed in version of, of a mouse's face here. Um, and then we're, we're performing this, this latent traversal, right? So we're, we're changing one, one latent at a time and just seeing what happens when we map that latent back into the, the image space. All right, so let's start, let's start with this one. This one's kind of the easiest one to think about. Here we're, we, we, we know that we have, we have supervised latents that correspond to the pupil size and, and position. So here we're just, we're just moving the latent that corresponds to the horizontal pupil location. And, and then when we map that back into the image space, we see this, this you know, nice interpretable you know, back and forth of, of, of the pupil. So that's, that's working pretty well. 
here's what happens if we change the, the, the vertical location. You can see um, this, 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 the, the vertical pupil is location is, is moving up and down a little bit. And then the obvious question is what, what happens if we look at the leftover stuff, right? What else is this model able to capture that, that wasn't in the original kind of tracked pupil supervised latents? Um, so one of the latents that turns out corresponds to, to opening and closing of, of the eyelid, right? That's something that maybe we should have been tracking originally, but, but we weren't when we performed this analysis. Um, another one up here corresponds to, you know, horizontal wiggles of, of, of the whiskers. Um, and I'm not showing it, but we also get another one correspond to, to kind of vertical motion of, of the whiskers. Um, so so if, if you kind of run this analysis, you can start to pull out things that are kind of pretty, pretty interpretable and, and kind of you can separate these different signals in this low dimensional space into things that you can, you can start to reason about and, and perform segmentation on or perform decoding, right? So here's, here's an example of the, of the latter, right? One of the, one of the things we're interested in is, you know, can I, can I take signals recorded in different parts of the brain and, and reconstruct this, this whole video? Right, that, that would be a, a cool demonstration that, that we're capturing, you know, important relevant signals um, that, are, that are reflected in, in, in the mouse's behavior, right? So, so here again is, is kind of a, a chunk of, of, of the raw, raw video data. Um, what we're doing is, is running this, this fancy semi-supervised autoencoder. Um, we're extracting a low dimensional representation and then, and then mapping this back into, the, into the, um, the, the, the image space. And what you see is that it's working pretty well, right? Um, we're, we're certainly missing some of the, the, the high frequency kind of you know, pixely level stuff, um, but we, we seem to be capturing most of what's going on in this video, in this reconstruction. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. And then we can go ahead and, and take signals from primary visual cortex or motor cortex or, or elsewhere in the brain and ask, okay, how well can we actually decode the, the, the low dimensional representation that's, that, that, that's being displayed here? And that's, that's exactly what we did. So in this case, we, we took some, some signals from, from visual cortex, tried to build a, a decoder that, that, that tracks these, these low dimensional latents and then mapped those latents back into the image space to, to see how well we're doing. And if you stare at these, these videos for a while, you see that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, whisker wiggles that, that, you know, maybe unsurprisingly are not really captured by the, by the visual cortex um, reconstruction here. We're able to, to do a pretty good job with, with some of these latents, but, but some of the latents are just kind of missing completely in this, at least in this, this small population of, of visual cort cortical neurons that we're, we're looking at in, this, in these trials. So all good? Any questions on that? All right. Okay, um, what are some other games you can play here? I think one of the one of the big unsolved problems here is is temporal segmentation, right? So after you've extracted out this hopefully rich represent rich and low dimensional representation of 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 the the video behavior, you'd like to do things like understand, okay, you know, the mouse is reaching now, or, or the mouse is is resting, or the mouse is is you know scrubbing its face, or something else, right? These mice do lots of different things and it's, you know, we're, we're, we're guessing that these different behavioral states are gonna co correspond to different um, neural states and we'd like to correlate back and forth between the two. So to do that, we, we'd love to be able to kind of perform temporal segmentation on these, on these extracted signals, right? And so again, there's been a huge amount of work doing, you know, fully unsupervised methods where, where maybe you fit kind of a hidden Markov model to, to the, 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 the temporal features that you pull out of these, these videos. On the other side, there's, there's fully supervised methods where you, where you take, you, you label a bunch of segments of, of video, and, and then you train your favorite neural network to, to perform segmentation. Um, again, we're we're kind of interested in combining the best of, of both worlds. So how do we how do we come up with an architecture that 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 allows for you know unsupervised information and supervised information? Um, so this is this is a short paper that's that's on the bioarchive. You can you can check it out. Um, in this case, we have three different losses that we've added. There's a there's a fully supervised loss where we're you know we've we've labeled a few segments of of, be, of behavior. Most of the data is not labeled because we're not patient enough to go through the whole data set to, to do the labeling. So we only have kind of a, a subset of frames that are kind of labeled here. Um, but but we, we also have a few other kind of simpler heuristics that we can add to the data, right? So maybe, maybe 
we say, well, I, I think that usually when the paw is really close to the face, maybe that's kind of grooming behavior, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm not sure about it, but but I can I can certainly measure the distance between the the, the paw and the, and the face, and if that distance is small enough, I'm gonna say okay, maybe that's maybe that's grooming behavior. Right? And, and because that's a, that's a cheap thing that I can do without having to hand label lots of different frames, that's, that's a signal that I can apply to the whole data set. Right? So that's kind of a, a weak supervision signal. It's not perfect, but it's, it's probably correlated with, with the grooming kind of states that we want to extract. And then we can also do things like, okay, we, we want you know, whatever representation we're pulling out of this out of out of this, this this video stream, we want it to be informative, right? We want it to capture a lot of information in the, in the raw data. So maybe what what we can do is is, is do some kind of auto encoding, right? Make sure that the whatever whatever the 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 kind of low dimensional space we end up working in, whatever that that space is that we learn, we we want to make sure that it, it it has good predictive qualities, right? We want to make sure that we can start from that low dimensional representation and then for example predict the behavior on the next time frame right and that's that's a fully it's like pca again right it's a fully unsupervised method that we can run on all the data without without doing any labeling and the hope is that when we combine this this unsupervised loss function with the semi supervised loss functions corresponding to these heuristics of what these behaviors should look like along with the strong supervised signals of okay I, I know on that on that segment I know exactly what the mouse is doing and I've got it hand labeled combine these these three different losses the hope is that we get we get better tracking and and so far um, the the result is that is that that's that's the case right if if you um, if you can weigh these different different signals properly, um, you can end up with, with very good reconstructions of, you know, still versus you know walking versus versus front grooming versus you know resting and so on. Um, and so these these methods seem to be pretty promising, um, and, and we're trying to kind of roll this out on, on more data sets now. So that's that's work that's still in progress. All right, so. So the hope is, you know, hopefully you've, you've seen there's 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 a huge amount of information that you can pull out of these videos. Um, I, I think we're actually still in kind of the early days of of you know methods for for handling this data and kind of making it work at, at large scale um, with with as little kind of user input as possible. Um, I, I do think that user input is is very important, but we want to minimize the we want to minimize um, user user effort. We're, we're happy to let computers do as much of our work for us as possible. Um, and, and so I think these semi-supervised approaches that I've talked about here um, are kind of a good good path forward for, for doing some of that. Any questions on the behavior stuff before I move on? So I, I have a question the semi-supervised behaviors, if that's possible. I didn't quite hear that. Can you try again? Sorry. Something before the semi supervised uh, open encoders, if that's possible. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe maybe put the, the question in the chat and I can I can respond to it there. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm finding it hard to. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Perfect. I had a question on the semi supervised open encoders, if it's possible. Yeah. Um, the latent um, could, uh, in general, be any combination of the two interpretable latents that you showed. Uh, how how do you reach um, easy to interpret latent? I mean, is there a way to automate this? Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, I, I, I should have been more clear on that. So, so you know, I, I showed you the architecture, but not the loss functions here. So we have we have several loss functions that are added together as, as usual. We have the the reconstruction loss, right? So we want to make sure that we can we can match the the tracking performance that we had before. We've got this reconstruction loss, so we want to make sure that the output here is as close as possible to the raw data as possible. And the, the thing I didn't mention, which is important, which I should add to the slide, is, is an unsupervised loss where we try to decorrelate these, these latents as much as possible. Right. So, so we have kind of, you know, people have tried lots of different ways of, of you know, disentangling these, these, you know, unsupervised latents from each other. So you end up with something that's Think of it as doing like independent components analysis, right? We want each of these latents to be as independent from as from each other as possible. And so we we took one of those standard losses from the literature and just added that in here. Um, so think of it as, as kind of an ICA loss. Um, and and yeah, that's that's what led to you know this this kind of thing where where kind of the you know the the motion of the whiskers tends not to be completely correlated with with the, the eye blinks. And so you can pull out a couple different kind of more or less disentangled signals here um, with, with, this, with this loss. 
So that's that's a great great question. I should have been more clear about that. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah, in the uh, in the behavioral stuff, um, you um, you had to set some temporal scale, right, for the for the behaviors, right? And I mean, like the for the whisking is much faster than for like an arm movement or something. But that's you, right. And maybe you could mention something on that. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So. <laughs> and and I think that's that's kind of a, a weakness of these semi-supervised methods, right? You you have these these different lambdas, the different kind of weights that you're going to add to the the supervised term versus the unsupervised term versus the different kind of losses that you have here. Um, so some of those can be set kind of automatically. So let me let me go back to the um, this deep graph pose stuff. So so yeah. So in, in this case, we have. Um, a couple different additional losses that aren't in the in the fully supervised setting. So we have these 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 spatial terms and also these these temporal terms. So so one thing you can do here is is use what's called an epsilon insensitive loss, right? So so I'm not going to worry about um, you know as as long as the the the, the thumb and the pinky are, are close enough together, as long as they're within some epsilon, um, I'm not going to worry about it, right? And and that that epsilon can be set automatically, right? If, if you label a bunch of data and the thumb and the pinky are, are never further apart than 10 pixels, then you can set epsilon to be 20 pixels and, and be done with it, right? So some of those, some of those losses or parameters can be set automatically. Um, but other losses, you know, you, you might have to kind of play around with a few different kind of um, a few different hyperparameters until you're happy with the results. Some of them, maybe you, you run cross-validation to kind of pick those hyperparameters automatically. Um, it's, it's definitely kind of, you know, that's, that's definitely a drawback of, of these, um, these, these fancier methods. You, you do end up with, with uh, more, more hyperparameters to think about. Um, so we, we, didn't, we didn't do it in the original paper, but, but I think, you know, moving forward, the, the approach there is, is again, just to, just to run the hyperparameter search in parallel over multiple, multiple instances on, on AWS um, to, to try to minimize the, again, minimize the, the user effort. Um, so to let, let the computer handle as much of that hyperparameter search as possible. Um, and, and again, that's, that's, that's much easier to do, much more tractable to do on, on the cloud than it is on, on, on your local um, heated up GPU. All right, awesome. Um, so let me, let me jump ahead to the last topic I wanted to talk about, which is this, um, you know, the, the, the question of, of multi-electrode data, right? So, um, so obviously, you know, a lot of you probably have experience with, um, with these, with these neural pixel recordings. Um, the, the IBL is, you know, our, 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 our first, first pass at, at this brain-wide map is, is gonna be completely based on these, these neural pixel recordings. If you haven't seen them before, there, there are kind of a couple, couple things that are, are important to, to know about. So these, these are kind of linear, long linear kind of probes that have many electrodes kind of embedded along the probe, right? And, and because of their, their size relative to the mouse brain, um, you can't help but get recordings from, from multiple brain areas simultaneously here, right? So, so in this case, um, this, this probe goes through multiple brain areas, the, the cortex, the hippocampus, down into kind of a, a variety of, of subcortical kind of regions. Um, and, and, and so you end up with, with data that looks like this. It's kind of localized along, along one dimension, the, the length along this, this, this probe. Um, and you can, you know, on a, on a good day, you can have, you know, clearly separated signals from, you know, hundreds of, of cells in, in multiple brain areas. So it's, it's an extremely rich source of, of data. And, and obviously, you know, these, these, these techniques have now been rolled out to hundreds or hundreds of, of, of labs around the world. So this is, this is really a huge source of data that, you know, that, that we need to, to do a good job on, right? So this is um, a, a pretty important challenge for, for us as a field to, to develop the, the, the platforms that can, that can handle this data and develop good, good analysis methods that, that build on these, these data sets. Okay, so given that I've, I've gone a little bit long already, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip some of the details here um, and, and really just, just focus on, um, on NeuroPixels recordings. Um, you know, I, I could give a whole talk on, on um, on other other types of, of EFIS data, but let's let's focus our attention on, on, on neural pixels recordings for for this talk. Okay, so so one of the 
really great things about this data is because these electrodes are, are pretty densely spaced, you can record simultaneously on multiple channels. You're, you're, you're going to be able to, to sense the signals of, of, of each cell on, on many channels, typically on the order of 10 or so channels. Um, and so what this buys you is, is you have a lot more information about, about each spike um, that you can use to, to perform spike sorting. So, so here's um, this is actually some retinal data, but, but NeuroPixels data looks very similar. Um, if, if you look at you know, seven electrodes worth of, of data over just, just 10 milliseconds, it's extremely rich data. Um, if, if you just look at this data, you see, okay, here's, here's a big spike that happens here. Here's maybe a smaller spike that happens here. Here's maybe a different small spike that happens there. The, the goal of spike sorting, of course, is to, is to take this, this raw data, detect all these little spikes that happen, and then assign each of those spikes to, to individual cells, right? Perform some kind of clustering, some kind of demixing, de just, just like we talked about in the calcium imaging setting, um, to, to go from the raw data to a, a representation of, of, of neurons by time instead of, instead of channels by time. All right, and the thing you should know about spike sorting is it's very much not a solved problem yet, right? So, so there have been a lot of papers that have, have kind of been written on the spike sorting problem, um, but you should, you should not trust any of them. Um, some of them work pretty well, some of them don't work very well. And, and you know, just, just when, when you're performing your, your analyses and your, 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 your cool theori theoretical models based on these, these neural pixels recordings, just, just be careful, right? I'm, I'm gonna talk about some of these issues as I go. But, you know, that's kind of the bad news. The, the, the good news is that, again, this is extremely rich data. And you can, you know, if, if, you, if you're doing a good job of, of spike sorting, you can actually assign even, even little small blips in the data that, you know, if, if, if I was just recording from this electrode, I would have no chance of knowing that this was kind of a, a, a nice little spike that I'm seeing there. But if, if you have this, this, this full spatial temporal context for multiple channels, you can start to do things like, well, look, I saw that this cell spiked here. And I can actually infer that okay, that's that little blip of, of activity. That's not really noise. That's that's the activity of a, of a well-defined cell that I can I can correlate back to this 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 original electrode down here. Um, so you can actually start to assign very small signals that you know because because they're happening synchronously with with other signals that are much larger elsewhere on the array. You can you can start to perform this demixing. Um, in, in a much more accurate way than was possible if you just had kind of single electrodes or kind of a small handful of electrodes. Okay. All right. So, like I said, let me let me skip over. We've we've done a lot of work in trying to push these these spike sorting methods forward in the context of of retinal recordings. Um, I think I'm going to skip over those in the interest of time. Um, you can you can. I'd be happy to talk about those offline if, if, if you're interested. But let me, let me kind of focus for the, the last few minutes here on, on NeuroPixels recordings, okay? Um, so, so again, you know, as, as part of the, the, the IBL, um, we've been very interested in, in rolling out existing spike sorting code on hundreds of data sets. And it hasn't gone well. <laughs> um, sometimes the code just, just fails for no apparent reason on, on some data sets. Um, we see all kinds of artifacts that, that are not really emphasized in the literature. So you see things like this, for example. So, so let, me, let me kind of orient you to what we're looking at. Here, it's just a rastrogram of multiple cells reported on a single, single array, All right. So here's, here's time down here. Here's space up here. This is, this is kind of the, the depth along this, this linear probe. And, and what we've seen a lot of are these are these weird stripes, right? So where all of a sudden, you know, the whole brain basically will be kind of firing simultaneously. And maybe this is something cool that's going on in the whole brain and it's kind of corresponds to communication between multiple brain areas. Or maybe it's just an artifact and, and you didn't kind of pull that out of your out of your raw data very well. Um, in this case, we, we actually think it's 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 an artifact. Um, if, if you go back and look at the raw data. Um, you see these these big synchronous kind of noise events that that are, are you know get pushed through your spike sorter and you end up with with spikes that that are completely artifactual. All right, so that's that's pretty bad news. And we've been working on on, on doing stripe subtraction in the raw data to kind of pull that out. Um, another big issue, you know, you see these stripes again in this data set over here. This is just a, a, a different data set from a different mouse, but you also see drift, right? So this, this cell is nicely localized going along. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the electrode array 
might have shifted very slightly with respect to the, the rest of the brain. Right? And if your spike sorter isn't capable of, of kind of tracking these non-stationarities over time, you know, any kind of downstream analysis you do based on the correlation between these different cells is going to be completely swamped by this very large kind of non-stationarity that's, that's in your data. So you have to be very, very careful about that. One, one kind of interesting thing about this, this drift is that it's actually spatially non-stationary as well. So if you look down here, kind of deeper in the brain, um, Sorry, I guess this 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 plot is flipped. So this is this is more shallow. So there 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 wasn't much of a, a drift relative to the brain down here, but there there is a huge shift up here, right? So so we need methods that can can handle that properly. Um, and then on on some data sets, there's just not as much going on in some parts of the brain as as we'd expect. Um, so that that makes us worry that you know maybe maybe something weird is going on in those in those recordings, right? So. To be clear, I, I don't think this is an issue for IBL data per se, right? So these, these are some of the, um, you know, the most skilled kind of experimental labs in the world who, who kind of developed these these neuropixels array recordings um, originally. It's but but the difference I think is that we're, we're we're looking at this data at very large scale. We have a lot of people looking at the data and trying to trying to do multiple different analyses on this data, and so we've we've discovered a lot of these artifactual issues that I think are probably present in, in all neuropixels recordings, and and they they're just not getting noticed because fewer people are looking at at, at some of these data sets. All right, so that's that's kind of the bad news. So so we've been working on on ways of of improving things, and I, I should say, you know, the, there's lots of people working on on ways of of improving these 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 recordings. Um, you know, here's here's something we've been we've been focused on. We can we can try to look at these 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 wobbly data sets over time and try to develop more more robust methods for kind of registering the data, right? So so one obvious thing you can do if you if you look at these here's here's a data set where where the experimentalist actually kind of push this, this probe up and down over time. So you have kind of a, you, you know what the wobble should look like. Um, so it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice data set for, for testing out these registration methods. So if you just perform kind of image registration on, on, these, on these multiple kind of frames of data, you can, you can start to, to kind of lock down this, this wobble in a way that, that you know, it's, it's much more stable over time. Um, so that's that's something we've worked on and, and other groups have worked on as well. Um, I, I think there's still room to improve here. Um, Another another big thing that we've we've worked on more recently is is trying to trying to pull out a more efficient representation of of the data. Um, so what do I mean by that? So so what I'm showing here is um, you know these these orange markers correspond to the the locations of of the array in space. So in this in this recording. Um, this is this is a NeuroPixels 2.0 array. So you have kind of just two columns of, of electrodes going in this long line across across a, a large part of the brain. So we're just showing kind of a subset of, of, of the electrodes here. Um, and if you if you take each spike that you detect on these on these multiple electrodes and, and denoise the data a little bit, um, it turns out you can you can do a pretty good job of triangulating the, the location of each of these spikes. Um, so you can you can kind of treat this this big electrode array is, is a big kind of an antenna array and, and look at the magnitude of, of each of these signals and each of these electrodes. And, and if you make a simple kind of point neuron, you know, very basic, incomplete, flawed model of, of the biophysics here, you can, you can write some code to do triangulation of, of these events. And, and what we're plotting here is, is the output of, of these methods. Um, so this, this yellow clump of cells corresponds to a bunch of spikes that are, are very close to the electrode array. Um, where we're, the, 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 the color here corresponds to the, um, the, the, the size of the spikes. So big spikes are, tend to be very close to the array. Small spikes out here tend to be much further away and, and, and more poorly localized, right? So smaller spikes are gonna be noisier and it, it's gonna be harder to localize those in space. Um, but but if, you, if you look at this, what you, what you see is that a lot of these little nice clusters in space can be very well localized and, and you can use those as, as features for, for downstream clustering or, or registration of the data. Um, so this is this is a very informative kind of feature that we can pull out of the data and use that for for downstream tasks. So here's here's a little example of that. Um, again, we're 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 looking at at, at the the electrode array here. Now we've we've changed the colors. I guess we we should have kept the old color scheme, but we've changed the colors. Each each dot here corresponds to a spike. Each green dot here corresponds to um, 
uh, an electrode on this on this on this array, and in this case, we're looking kind of face on the electrode array. Where we're performing a, a three dimensional kind of a, a max project onto the data. Over here, we're looking kind of um, with the array kind of sideways. So so basically, you know, the purple spikes down here are kind of far from the array. The yellow spikes up here are close to the array, and we can see very clearly that. You know, in this in this wobbly data set, we can see these these clusters, and we can see how they're wobbling over time, and we can use this 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 wobble to kind of you know, you know, try to try to register the data over time. So that's that's what's being shown in the bottom row down here, where we're we're taking kind of a, a denoise representation of 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 these 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 clusters of spikes over time, and then we're performing a, a registration to to try to make these these clusters stay as kind of still as possible over time. Um, so we can, we can then cluster them and, and run our favorite spike sorting tools on the on the registered data. Is that all clear? I have a question about the, the wobble. So if I understand correctly, the, the wobble is a way of uh, perturbing the data and trying to correct it, right? And, and, and trying to learn how to fix that in a way. So it's a wobble that's intentionally done by the experimenter to, to be corrected later. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So this this was all right. So the we we see drift in you know a, a non-trivial fraction of of recordings. Um, maybe in say a third of recordings, you can kind of visibly see some drift over time. Um, and of course, there's there's probably many more recordings where if you if you zoom in further, you could you could probably detect drift as well. Um, in this data set. And, and so that's just kind of natural drift. Just, you know, we, we, we tried our best to keep the electrodes still over time, but the animal moved and, and maybe there was some slight drift in the electrode position over time. In this data set, this was, this was kind of purposely recorded to, to, to test the limits of, of drift correction. Um, so they, 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 they imposed, I mean, you can, you can see the locations of these cells drift quite a lot with respect to the electrode electrode array and you can see large changes in the shape of these of these spikes over time um, but of course the the advantage here is that we we know what drift was was injected if if you look at this data set there's there's actually quite a lot of natural drift as well kind of ironically there's so there's there's a combination of kind of slow drift that you can see over part of the recording and then this bigger drift that you can see that's that's experimentally imposed um, and so we can we can kind of try to track both of those over time here how similar is this to, I mean, the, the artificial drift, how similar is it to the natural one? I mean, the natural drift also goes both ways. And then yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple differences. So, so this drift, you know, it's periodic in a way that, that you don't see in, in real data. Um, the, the scale was, was chosen to be pretty generous. So this, this drift is, is larger than we usually see in, in, in real data, but it's, we've certainly seen data sets that have this this size drift or even bigger. Um, so the scale is you know maybe on the generous side, but but certainly comparable to real data sets. Um, and the the speed is also chosen to kind of match match real real drift that, that we see in, in data. Um, so I think the, the big differences are are that you know real drift isn't isn't constant and periodic in this way. It's you know in, in, in real data you typically see kind of more or less stationary data and then a little bit of drift and then more or less stationary and then maybe a little slow drift over time. Um, but but in other respects it's 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 pretty well matched to, to real data examples that we've seen. Thanks. All right. Is it not sufficient for us to normalize the data together as I didn't hear that one. Apologies. Is it not sufficient just to normalize the patient? So we'll get into the low frequency, so the mean stays constant. Did you hear is, is it the question is is it not sufficient to get to get rid of the mean and basically the this the uh, low frequency? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So yeah, I, I should say, you know. I think there's a lot more work to be done here. So I, I would I would love to hear any of your clever ideas for for doing this in a, in a simpler, better way. Um, yeah. So if if you're able to cluster each of these things, so the problem is that we don't know the identity of these spikes a priori, right? We just collect a bunch of spikes and we can extract, you know, an estimate, a crude location of of the estimate of each of these spikes, but we don't actually know which. We haven't done 
clustering on these spikes, right? You could, you could, you could, you know, do a lot of spike sorting on each of these little frames and then try to match up each of the clusters that you get on frame one with frame two and frame three and so on, where the frames are, you know, maybe maybe a second worth of data or so. Um, that's expensive and and any any errors you make in that clustering step are going to propagate into your registration step. So we've we've tried to use use, use methods that that don't rely on clustering, that, that just try to just try to take this raw data representation and 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 try to try to register register one frame to another. Um, so yeah, if if you knew exactly where each of these clusters were, you could, you could kind of take take means and then just subtract off the mean. Um, but but you have to you have to believe those means, I guess. And if, if you don't believe those means, then then you might actually end up injecting more noise into your recordings than than you had originally. Um, also, you have to be be a little bit careful about this non-stationarity over over space, right? Some some areas move move a lot more than others, and so you wouldn't want to just extract a single mean across the whole array and and apply that. You you, you want to kind of operate a little more locally, both both in space and in time. Did that address the question? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's most of what I wanted to to say related to this, um, you know, the spike sorting stuff, you know, obviously, you know, I've, I've purposely, there, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do with, with spike sorted data, right? Most of, most of my career has, has been spent kind of avoiding spike sorting and, and, you know, playing fun games with, you know, building, building cool models of the correlations between cells or decoding spike sorted neural activity. Um, but, but I think we really have to stop and, and address these spike sorting questions now because because we, we we don't want we, we want to have kind of a, a nice solid foundation for all the all the all the analyses we want to do downstream. Um, and so there, there's a bunch of kind of open questions here. Um, you know, if, if if you guys are looking for for course projects, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to to discuss any of these any of these further. Um, there's there's lots more work to be done here. Um, and and so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd welcome welcome further further thoughts or, or um, you know input here. Um, I guess I guess I'll close on on you know you know this this last slide. Um, I, I think you know over, over the last ten years, you know, like I said, it's it's been a super exciting area to work in. It's it's really crazy to think about where we were ten years ago and, and where we are today, um, how how far we've come. Um, but but I guess my overall feeling is is that there's still kind of a huge amount of, of work left to be done, and then we really need, um, you know, young clever scientists to be kind of working in this area and, and pushing things forward. Um, I, I guess the big kind of meta point that I tried to emphasize throughout here is is this kind of scaling gap. So so going from kind of a single data set methods that work well and kind of a nice single data set often break when you when you kind of go to scale and i think i think that's going to be an issue for for the whole field as we see more and more of these multi-lab collaborations kind of kind of produce very large interesting data sets and um, so i think that's a big big issue for the field that we need to grapple with and i guess you could tell from from my last set of slides that you know my my overall feeling is that there's there's been a you know a decades worth of work on, on calcium imaging data there's been you know, obviously, multiple decades worth of work on computer vision that if, that we've pulled into to behavior video analysis that's made a big impact. Um, I I really think that you know neuropixels recordings are are being done, like I said, in, in hundreds of labs now. Um, and and if I had to pick kind of a one of these data sets where where I'm kind of um, more nervous about the the basic data quality, um, I, I really think we need to work harder on on neuropixels recordings. It's it's going to be a hugely powerful platform, but 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 we really need to work as a field to um, to to improve the, the the basic basic processing chain there. So I think that's really important to remember to remember as you as you go ahead and try to analyze some of this data in, in your your future work. So that's it for me. Thanks thanks so much for for all of your all of your great questions.